for tonight. Thank you all again. And yes, mm -hmm. we're recording the meeting. Um, so let me read, let me read a little um, introduction that I've that I've written, I suspect most of you already know who our special guest is. But just in case, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. I can't read as much as I would like to because then it would take the whole 90 minutes if I read everything. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to get to some of the bits and pieces. Um, so our guest, Philip Khan Gotanda, is an acclaimed playwright who for more than three decades has crafted and presented a unique voice that previously had been heard little on the American stage. He is a leading figure in Asian American drama and as part of an Asian American theater movement began in the late 1970s to chronicle the emergent Asian American identity, as well as going beyond that to explore and present experiences of the human condition with particular interest in the marginalized and the traditionally underrepresented. His work has been praised for encompassing a wide range of distinct and experimental styles, themes, and techniques, such as realism, surrealism, and the incorporation of music and dance. He is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as many other honors and awards, including um, awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Pew Trust, and the Asian American Theater Company Lifetime Achievement Award. His works have been widely produced throughout the United States and abroad. A short sampling of his long list of plays include The Wash, Yankee Dog You Die, The Dream of Kitamura, The Ballad of Yachio, Sisters Matsumoto, After the War, and Pool of Unknown Wonders, Undertow of the Soul. Philip is also a filmmaker, and he wrote and directed three films, The Kiss, Life Tastes Good, and Drinking Tea, which we'll watch shortly. So, uh, and then I want to end this intro by mentioning that Philip is also embarking on his new career. I forgot to ask how many years he's been doing this. I, I think maybe close to 10 years as a professor teaching in the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies at UC Berkeley. So welcome, Philip. Thank you, thank you for having me. Or I got exhausted just reading that. So, um, <laughs> um, how how are things going? I, I wanted to start off this interview just by saying we are living in extraordinary times right now. So, how are you and your loved ones? Is everyone okay? You know, on our end, everyone seems uh, at the moment to be maintaining well. So, I think for myself, you know, my family and extended uh, community by and large, we're faring well. It's just the whole country in general is in such a tumultuous state that I think everyone wakes up with this huge kind of dark cloud hanging over them, wondering what's going to happen next. And especially, not figuratively and literally, in the Bay Area, that dark cloud is hanging all around us. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm presently in Southern California, and there's a dark cloud down here, too. It's, I think, all along California. Kind of... Uh, frightening. <clears throat> yeah, well, but it's good to hear that um, you're doing well and mm -hmm. um, you're kind of busy right now, sounds like. Um, I know you're in the middle of teaching, right? Yeah, that's taking up, and the majority of my time is, is teaching and what's happening in all the universities and in particular UC Berkeley is that everything is adjusting to one, being taught virtually. So I t teach everything, attend all my meetings, my one-on-one -on -one sessions are all done through Zoom. And the other is that uh, the entire school and our department is trying to figure out how to negotiate the Black Lives Matter, COVID-19, these very big issues, in particular Black Lives Matter, how to change our curricula, how we teach, how we view aesthetics of what is good theater, you know, whose theater is it? Is it to your, is it, you know, Eurocentric and as a consequence has to be perhaps dismantled, uh, decentered. So much of my schoolwork uh, has to do with that. And that is both very, very engaging 
but also extremely exhausting in terms of contending with those issues that all of us are and that to a great extent aren't resolved. They're like, we're all in the mix of it. And that is, that's kind of a disquieting state, not to sound so negative about everything, but uh, the work at Cal really involves a lot of that. So, but then I have my creative work that I still do and I really enjoy my students who are at Cal, they're extremely smart, very bright, very open. That's what I like about Cal students. So it's, it's really interesting that you bring up um, sort of uh, the deconstruction of, you know, of sort of institutionalized things that we've always sort of thought, mm -hmm. taken for granted maybe, but are being questioned anew, which is, I think, a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I can see where it's very challenging. On the other hand, I want to say, don't you feel like you've been preparing this your whole life? I mean, <laughs> don't you think some of your work was challenging these boundaries? way back? You know, I would say yes, but also what it means is there's a whole new world that's kind of kind of dropped in, which also almost decenters uh, people of color who are non-black or non-indigenous peoples. So for me, one of the big things to figure out is how I, as an Asian American, uh, fit into or adjust or support, you know, or help to decenter, you know, all ways of thinking and how to bring in my own perspective that is in keeping with sort of the Black Lives Matter movement. I just think it's a, a tricky way, tricky thing to sort of negotiate. And also I found that a lot of my work in terms of the intersectionality of African Americans and Asian Americans isn't the appropriate thing to discuss at this point in time. It's sort of maybe down the road, but we're at a different point in time right now where the, the focus as it should be is on the sort of black indigenous people's experience. And that some of the things that I wrote about in the past, some of the things that I've even felt and talked about in relationship to Asian Americans, uh, allow me to understand the bigger picture, but at the same time, it isn't that easy to participate in. Um, so that's one of the very interesting challenges right now of being sort of an Asian American who has a history and kind of a movement, a third world movement, and then to find yourself now in a situation where that model isn't what's working now. That model is not what is not the one that's being uh, brought to the fore. So for me, it's after a lifetime of working with kind of an Asian American movement foundation, uh, a third world foundation, uh, it requires, again, very uh, strong amount of you know, rethinking and perhaps to some degree decentering the way I even view the world, not I even, but I view the world. So in response to your question, Catherine, it's, it, yes, it allows me that kind of history to look at some of what's going to understand uh, what's going on. At the same time, it, uh, it, it also challenges everything that I, I believed and thought uh, up to this point too. Yeah, I, I think we're all being challenged in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to kind of turn that question on its head a little bit. And mm -hmm. instead of talking about it from may, maybe as a social issue, talk about it from a creative point of view. So, um, you know, I would assume that, um, you know, so you're used to sort of creative output. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. But here you're doing two things that seem different to me. First of all, I think what you're saying is we're being put in the position of having to listen maybe more than talk, right? Mm -hmm. And, but you're in the position of teaching so you in a way you're being asked to do something that maybe goes against the way you used to do things as a playwright mm -hmm. um, because now you're a teacher and now you're a listener but you also still need to be to have like some kind of output a creative output and also you know just you have to articulate so mm -hmm. how are you how are you balancing all of this well i think initially for the first you know i think maybe for the last nine months or so, I realized that I, 
I didn't know what to say and I didn't know how to say it. And so I, I actually just kept my mouth shut. You know, again, the idea of when you, when you say something, when you create something, to me, it has to come from a place of some kind of uh, consistent worldview. You know? And for me, at, in the last sort of eight or nine months, my worldview has been very kind of jumbled and uh, in flux. And I really kind of just sat there for a long time thinking, I, I, I don't know what to say at this point, and so I won't say anything. Um, and then recently I begun to do creative work again and, and begun to find sort of some kind of, uh, I say some kind of position or stance that allows me to feel I have, a, I have a story to say. There's something valid about what I can offer uh, that can stand up outside my body. And that also that I can feel within my own soul and body that is justified. So if it is criticized, I know that it comes from a place of like my very thoughtful truth, my own truth. And that's really important, you know, that mm -hmm. I can make sure what I put out there, I can live with because there's so much now that's really, you know, it's very kind of, it's dicey to put stuff out now. Art, opinions, ideas, you know, uh, because, social media and so many different kinds of things are out there that might attack you, throw you off kilter, change the discussion, that I really think it's important that you, for me anyways, to have a really strong sense of self, you know, a kind of a, a source of pool of consistent information that I believe in, that whatever comes out of me is from that and I can I know I'm comfortable with it. I know it feels justified in my own belief system. So, uh, you know, in terms of teaching, I teach in much the way I taught before, which has always been to bring in a, a whole diverse amount of voices. Uh, I bring in many guest speakers now because I feel like they're better to say the things that uh, need to be said. And then creatively, uh, I've moved more into forms of music that perhaps uh, are less traditional and perhaps don't necessarily deal, this is interesting, I'm just realizing this, don't necessarily deal specifically in terms of naming issues like race and culture. I'm dealing with uh, opera and the composers are dealing and work with new music, which is to say it's not traditional music, they use invented instruments, um, but nonetheless, I'm bringing to it a text I feel that is uh, coming from my body and my, my history. And that I'm dealing also with uh, some kind of more orchestral music. You know, I was telling Catherine and Jill that I, I met a Japanese American composer named Shinji Eshima from Berkeley. So maybe some of you know Shinji, whose father was an architect in Berkeley. And I think Shinji's brother is a well-known uh, plastic surgeon. <laughs> but Shinji is a, a principal contrabassist with the SF Ballet Orchestra. But recently Shinji has moved into composing and uh, I met him at a gathering. We began to talk and we sort of looked at each other and said, another Japanese American <laughs> who's involved in the arts who's over 60, you know, right? <laughs> and who lived in Berkeley. We both lived in Berkeley. This was kind of like, you know, finding the other unicorn. We kind of like touched unicorns or something. <laughs> uh, so we, that alone was enough that made us talk and begin to see if we could collaborate. And so we've embarked on, you know, several possible projects of, again, he does beautiful kind of orchestral music. Uh, if you ever want to listen to some of it, there is a, a ballet he composed several years ago called Raku, R-A-K-U, and that it was done at the SF Ballet featuring the Chinese uh, principal ballet artist, Guan Wan, and it's, he created the score for it. And it's just such a gorgeous score that, again, you know, if there is a kind of Japanese-American aesthetic, you know, 
for me, that was it when I heard his music. I said, this, it, I understand it, you know, there's something about the way it feels and sounds makes sense to me. And so again, when I find that or encounter that, I pursue it and hopefully Shinji and I are able to uh, come up with something. We, sh we shall see. And uh, you know, every, every now and then I meet another Japanese American whom, who's an artist uh, and whom I you know, am hopefully going to work with because I do think Ultimately, there is a point of view, there's a history that everything comes from that, you know, as best as one can is shared. And as a consequence, you know, sometimes the art that you create uh, has, has an ability to intersect and create a kind of common voice uh, that is different if I were to work with other people. The other folks that I collaborate with, it doesn't mean the art's not good, but it is different, you know, and uh, growing up Japanese American for me, or Asian American is just, it's key. It's, it's the foundation. It's the household I grew up in. So even if I step outside the house, that is so much a foundation of who and what I am, that it is always part of whatever comes out of my body in the form of creative expression. I, I would really love to talk more with you about um, the Japanese American voice, mm -hmm. which so hopefully we can do that later on. I want to um, sort of move us towards the movie. Yeah. Um, but you did mention music. So I want to one thing I didn't mention in the introduction is that you have a music background. Um, okay. And you did start off as a musician and you did give me a CD of your music. <laughs> um, so uh, do you want to say a little bit about about how you got started in music way back? Well, I, I like to play the guitar and sing songs. And, uh, you know, I just have to mention that in terms of the CD, Peter Horikoshi, who is here, uh, helped basically produced it and put it together for us. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Wendy. Um, you know, uh, from the time I was a kid, I loved to make music. So by the time I was in my late teens, I was like writing songs. But I, the thing is, I was writing original songs about being Asian American or Japanese American. And so when I went out into the world and was trying to pitch this to record companies, the idea of singing songs about being Japanese American, like Asian American Dream or All American Asian Punk or The Ballad of the Issei, that wasn't the most commercially viable product to have. That was, <laughs> you know, so uh, what happened is I eventually moved on and went to law school. Uh, and, uh, that became a three-year journey and then after that I wrote a musical and then that led me into theater but I did start for a good 10-13 years uh, working as a singer-songwriter. Well I was hoping to um, play some of your music but I'm not sure I have the technology for it so we may we may maybe have some kind of musical reunion or something, or we can work out some kind of musical evening um, where we can play yes, your music. So that would be, that would be a lot of fun. Okay. But um, if we move on to your movie, mm -hmm. um, would you like to maybe set it up? Um, first of all, this is a movie from the 90s. Yes. And so you made three films mm -hmm. that were all in the 90s, I believe, in the 1990s. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about, you know, you know, you were about how old? You were in your thirties? Thirties, forties, yeah. 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 So, you know, this when people watch these movies, you will notice that, you know, it's definitely taking place in a different in an earlier time. Mm -hmm. But um still I think um the the themes that you talk about, especially in drinking tea, are timeless in a way. And and they don't just um, reflect maybe a Japanese American sensibility. I think you you were reaching for something um, maybe bigger than that. I don't know. You can talk about that. But would you like to introduce the film Drinking Tea before we start, or talk about the other two films as well? Uh, well, there was a you know my first love was one of my first loves was film, and when I first started out, making films was really hard and really expensive which changed quite a bit. And uh, after I established myself as a playwright, I was able to begin to return to filmmaking. And uh, I wrote a play that was adapted, I adapted into a film called The Wash, which mm -hmm. 
you know, fairly successful. And then I wanted to make my own films, but no one would give me money because I was a playwright. So I decided I was just gonna go out and make my own films. And so I went out and raised my own money, got my own cast and began to produce my own movies. So I made a first a 13 minute film that did very well. And suddenly I was a filmmaker. I did a half an hour film, Drinking Tea, which did very well. And then I made a feature film that also went to Sundance uh, as a uh, official selection. So I kind of made three films, and then subsequent to that, I stopped making films. They were so difficult to make as an independent producer. Uh, but um, this is the second one that I made. And it's, uh, the story is based on a um, story I heard about one of my relatives. And the basic story is he uh, was an older gentleman who was dying. He had a health issue. And he began seeing, he's, he was married, and he began seeing this other woman, this other older woman, and began to go visit her all the time and finally moved in with her. And his own wife could not figure out what he was doing or why he was doing it. Uh, and it turned out that this other woman that he moved in with uh, was also dying. And that there was something about him wanting to understand or developing some kind of relationship with this woman that caused him to do what he did. It wasn't justified or anything, and uh, it is what it is, but I used that as the basis for what I thought would make a very good film story. And so that is the basis and the seed for drinking tea. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'll just mention a couple things before I share the screen. One is, um, we should get the wash on DVD. So if anybody knows anybody who can get the wash or any of um, Philip's films on DVD and maybe get Janum or somebody, uh, let's do it because uh, it, I have a devil of a time finding your films. And then uh, you and I had to play tag so that I can get the DVD for this film for today. Um, so I'm just shouting that out to everybody. Um, second, I was able to find um, Life Tastes Good, which I saw a long time ago when it first came out. Mm -hmm. um, it is streaming. So if anybody uh, gets the free um, streaming service called Tubi, T-U-B-I, if you have Roku, it will be one of the channels available on your Roku. Look for the Tubi channel and then do a search on Life Tastes Good and you can watch Philip's 90-minute uh, feature-length film which is really quite good and funny and it's wonderful. So um, uh, for those of you, uh, I recommend that. Um, the third thing I wanna mention is that if you, uh, when we're watching um, Drinking Tea, you will notice, um, look for the wife's sister's husband. He, <laughs> makes, a, he makes a very brief appearance and, um, I think in the credits, the, the, the actor listed is Joe Ozu, I believe. <laughs> Might um, be, yeah. Yes, so just keep your eye out for that character. You'll just see him for just a few seconds, but um, it's sort of a Hitchcock thing, I think, where yeah. the filmmaker likes to appear uh, in his films, yeah? Yes. Okay, um, and then the last thing I wanna mention before I share the screen is everybody right now, if you can, just uh, disable your video. Just do. Just click on stop video, um, so everybody's video will turn off, um, and then that way, I believe the the film will show um, a little easier. Okay, so let me let me try to start that.
My sister told me that the practice of tea ceremony was the acceptance of the accidental nature of life, its budding flower, and its bitter passing. Sometimes a man can dwell too much on the bitterness and become dead inside. He is said to be a man with no tea in him. This is the story of one such man. I called you 20 minutes ago. The pancakes are cold. You feeling okay? Mm -hmm. You gonna be home for dinner? I had begun sleeping alone in my son's room. Mary couldn't understand why I moved out of our bedroom. Sometimes I just lay there remembering how Donnie and I used to go up to the mountains together, how we'd build a fire and camp next to the river, and how we'd sit there staring at the flames all night long, father and son together.
I met her at Dr. Higa's office. She sat down next to me and just started talking about her illness. I began to visit her. I don't know what I was looking for. Kuki, my sister-in-law, worried about my health. Sometimes I'd come home and find her waiting for me, sitting on the floor, practicing her tea ceremony. found out about me visiting the woman and began calling home in the afternoon. Mary? To see if I was there. This is the Ogawa residence. Hello? I'd lick in on Khan. How was work? Same as always. Was he here when you got here? Did you take all your medicines like you're supposed to? Khan? What for? I'll get them. He took it. He just wants to make me feel bad for him. About everything. Maybe she was right. I don't know. All I know is one morning, I just got up and I had to go there. And I couldn't explain it to Mary because I didn't know why myself. you do funny things. So sweet this time of year. They're freestone. Mm. Mm. You don't mind. I won't bother you. Mm. You know, the neighbors and everything. Not now. Not anymore. I don't care if he comes home treating me like this. He can't work. I have to do everything. He just sleeps all the time. Eats and sleeps, eats and sleeps. 
Little kids. All my life, I've been taking care of little kids. They are always bring the teacher and an apple. I can take care of you. You know what I mean. Towards the end. He's always blamed me for Donnie's death. That was an accident. That was 10 years ago. You know, I think he blames me for his illness, too. That somehow it caused him to get the way he is. Sweet. Very sweet. Hmm. She's old. Just a bag of bones. A spinster nobody wants. What does he see in her? You have to make noise to show you're enjoying it. Take some of mine. It's stronger. Uh, you need it more. It makes me fall asleep. Well, sleep's good for you. I can smell the flowers. I can taste the lemon. I'm not here. Sleep is like being dead. I love blossoming flowers. They're like children, eh? Yeah. By now, a month had passed, and I missed Mary. But there was still something I was looking for in Sumi. Something I needed to understand. Mary was probably just visiting her sisters, who was close to Cookie and her architect husband. But I had other things to worry about.
for me. Yeah, for me. Death has a smell, doesn't it? It's kind of odd human perfume. And then we both smell of it. Why are you here? What do you want from me? You have a pretty young wife. What are you looking for? What did I want? What was I looking for? Suddenly, I felt so confused. Sumi was dying. I was sick. I worried about Mary. And I missed my son. My son, Donnie. <laughs> it was as if something loosened up inside my body could breathe again. I don't know if I understood anything any better. I just knew I had to go home now. She must have gone to her sister's house. How you been? Good. You? Good. How's your girlfriend? I was trying to figure out about myself. What was happening to me? Well, what did you find out? I want you to come home. Take care of me till the end. Hurt? 
worse now? Yeah. How come she doesn't take care of you now? What kind of woman is she, huh? She's dead. She was dying. She was always dying. I'm not ready yet. You've shamed me so much. Go home. But that's the one thing I couldn't do. Well, without Mary. Son's gone. I can accept that now. It wasn't your fault. forgotten what he had done but as the months had passed we had come to a kind of understanding I would take care of him till the end he was getting weaker and weaker and though he appeared to be okay we both knew the end was near maybe he had changed a little from this whole experience cookie said he finally had become a man with tea in him In the end, he slipped away quietly. He looked like he was sleeping. And for some reason, I went ahead and poured the tea. A little in his cup, a little in my cup, back and forth until our cups were filled. I remember him once asking me why I pour the tea this way and my explanation. As you pour the tea, the flavor gets stronger. This way, it evens out the bitterness.
Okay, we're back. Everybody can um, turn their videos back on if you like. Um, Philip, are you back? <clears throat> oh, I am back. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank right. you. Thank you for that movie. Did you watch it? I watched the whole thing. I, I, you know, this is the first time I've seen it in maybe 15 years. Yeah. It's really interesting. Wow. To it. Yeah, I want to get your thoughts. And also, if anybody wants to... Uh, um, um, express your thoughts, please share with us in chat. But um, and I want to point out that fabulous cast one more time. Um, that was Saab Shimano and um, Nobu McCarthy and Diane um, Kobayashi mm -hmm. and uh, your wife, mm -hmm. Diane. Diane, yeah. Diane Take played um, Cookie. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I what are your thoughts on seeing it again? Um, I, yeah, I, I, I liked it. You know, it, it does what I, I, I hoped it would do. And, uh, you know, I was interested. I remember when I came up the story and I said I was going to do this. Every, almost everyone said, what? <laughs> I said, I told them the story and they said, what? Uh, but... Uh, I'm, you know, I, this was the story I wanted to do, and I, it made sense in my head, and uh, I, the characters made sense to me in my head, and, uh, and so we made it. Um, and I must say, when you do work like this, you realize it really helps if you work with other uh, artists who are, are really good. And, you know, fortunately, I was able to have, in particular, like Diane Kobayashi and Diane Takei, and in particular, Saab Shimono and Nobu McCarthy. You know, if you've seen them in any other works, they're well-known, they were well-known artists. And uh, they, uh, they're they like my two friends who are willing to be in my plays and be in my films. And boy, it really helps. I was just watching them going, boy, they can put so much into feeling and expression into just their faces and their and their movements. And they And they, for me, embodied kind of this world that I really, I'm in love with and wanted to be in the movie. It's a kind of world and a feeling and uh, they were able to capture that. Also what's interesting is uh, Dan Kuramoto uh, from the band Hiroshima uh, composed the music for it. I mean, I've been working, I've been working with him doing his music, doing uh, music and uh, I think the score is gorgeous. And uh, so uh, I, you know, for me, I was able to enter into it and, and follow the whole story and not be self-conscious about this is my film and look at all the things that are wrong. You know, I, I just was able to get into the story. So for me, that that makes me feel uh, feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm getting some comments here that it was very moving. Mm -hmm. um, and a uh, question, was Mary also transformed by the end, you think? I believe she was, and if there's, as I watched the film this time, you know, that's something I think I would have worked a little bit more, I would have worked on, you know, her character and having some kind of moment of her own kind of decision, whether she decided that she wasn't going to forgive him, but that, that was, she would just, you know, we would go on the way they were, or that she began to see Never, she could never forgive him, but she finally began to see and understand what he was doing. I think I might have kind of landed in that kind of place. Mm -hmm. I think, again, the idea of she couldn't forgive him for what he'd done, but maybe she began to understand why he did what he did. Which was, yeah, I think, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm, that was it. Yeah. Um, what's remarkable is in a you know, in a fairly short amount of time, I feel like these were fully realized characters. You know, like I, I, I feel like I knew who they were. So um, I could maybe fill in the blanks also, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so even um, Mary, 
felt like, you know, a fully realized person to me. So even though I didn't know quite the answer, you know, of how she was feeling at the end, I can, um, I still sympathized with her, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, still wanted, wanted a good outcome for her. And so um, I think, you know, for a 30 minute film, especially, um, it really, and, and you're right, the acting is amazing. I think some of the best stuff I've seen Sab Shimono do. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, one question I have is, where did you get the idea for the match motif of letting the match burn out on both ends? You know, that's one of those things where I think I was at a bar. <laughs> and, and kind of bar trick you. Somebody did it at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's cool, and I'll always remember that. And uh, the interesting thing, though, is to actually do it is kind of impossible without burning your hand. So what we had to do is, as Saab was sitting there, he asked, his right hand is actually in a bucket of ice. No. Little tricks that you, you don't know when you see it in a dramatic moment. So he took his hand out of the ice and then grabbed the kind of hot end, because otherwise it would have burned his finger. So he was able to, to do it that, that way. But I must say, what, what made him so professional is that you know, someone like Saab, I could say, and then when the flame goes out, Saab, we're going to have the camera right on your face, and then you break down. Uh, you know, so for him, he has to have his hand in a bucket of ice. He has this really dramatic scene. He brings it out. He takes the flame. And the camera is sitting right on him. And then it burns out. And then he has to go through this whole thing of bringing out the black ribbon and to break down. And uh, we only did two takes on it. And in both, he was able to just do it. And uh, that's something that, again, if you're working with actors, that's remarkable, you know, that he is such a professional that he can just do all of that stuff. Uh, he did ask for everyone to get out of the way in front of him, though. He did say, everyone in front of me, get out of the way so that I can get in the mood of it. So... But, uh, and, and Nova McCarthy is just has such wonderful quality, she just stands there and you kind of, uh, account, and she just stands there and she's so full in terms of her uh, feeling. And uh, I, I, you know, really miss working with her. She used to be in all of my plays and Saab I still can work with. He's still around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody is still, everybody from the movie is still with us except for Nobu. Nobu, yeah. Um, and I do miss her. It was, um, it was wonderful to see her again. She's so beautiful. Um, yeah. So, you know, what's amazing to me is I'm asking you these questions about a movie that was made 25 years ago or so, and you're still remembering um, details. Is, do, do you really remember this experience? Yeah, actually I do. I think making films is such an... Uh, emblematic moment, it sort of burns itself <laughs> into your, your head because it's so, it's an intense process, you know? Like I remembered, that's our old house in San Francisco in Glen Park. You know, that one that had looked like the Adams Family family house, like it's yeah. like a story of Victorian in Glen Park and we had just painted it. And I was, I remember thinking, we spent a fortune painting this thing. <laughs> <laughs> painting Victorians cost so much. Anybody who lives in San Francisco. Wow. But uh, yeah, that was our house. And then we also used the house of, um, boy, she's, she's runs for supervisor now. It's her parents' house. Uh, what is Japanese American woman? She's, she wears the hats all the time. Kind of I don't know. Does anybody know? Let me know in chat. I can't think of her name. But it's her parents' house at the time. And he used to be a professor over at San Francisco State. And Emily she, Marase. Yes, that's her parents' house that we shot that at, uh, a lot of the scenes. And, uh, but we were able to, again, you know, we just asked around and people were helped out. And so uh, the Marase said, sure, come on over. And then we <laughs> took over their household. And they were very nice and gracious and let us uh, shoot there. Oh, that Victorian actually looks really beautiful. I was thinking that's that looks great when it when you dissolve from the when he's sleeping on the porch at yeah, night that. and then it dissolves in day and i thought wow what a beautiful house 
all I could say is never buy a hundred year old Victorian because it, it'll just eat up all your money. Uh. You know, it, it, they leak and they, you can never find the leaks because they're a hundred years old and they, they kind of turn and move and they're, they're wonderful if you're really young and really want that house. But if you're older, it's, wee. I don't know if anyone lives in Victoria here, but <laughs> wow, a lot of work. So. Well, you know, um, you are, you know, a little bit older now. And so you, you're watching this movie from a different vantage point. Did it, did it strike you a little differently? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm actually amazed that it, when I was younger that I was, I was so drawn to themes that have to do with aging and uh, dying and loneliness that comes from aging that uh, my, my wife would always say, you know, one day you're going to be old, Philip, and then, you know, you don't have to feel like you're old, you will be old. <laughs> so now she looks at me, she goes, you know what, you're old now. <laughs> I, I, and I still identify with the, the world. Uh, it just makes sense to me and I could feel it inside my body. And so uh, I think also, you know, it, it, it captures a certain kind of time in Japanese America. I grew up in Stockton in a very Japanese American community, you know. Thus, me sitting here looking at all of, the, all of you is like kind of being back in Stockton when I, as I grew up, this is the world, you are my, kind of wheelhouse in which I grew up. Uh, and so seeing the film reminds me that that is a world that I, I just feel comfortable uh, inhabiting when I write. And uh, even now I wrote something recently, uh, again, that sort of goes back to this, this kind of world. Because I feel like there's validity in still telling a story even if it's in a certain period and even if it has the elements of a specific culture if I can make it universal, which is what I always strive to do, then it, it deserves to live and it, it has earned its right to be there. You know, that it isn't, it, it's, it's earned its right to exist. Culturally specificity, a psychology that, you know, the story really inhabits a certain kind of, it's inhabited by a psychology that comes from that world. And if you are from that world, I sometimes feel like you're seeing a different film than someone who, who isn't. I'd like to think everyone has access to the film, but it really is a different, you're, you're seeing a different film and feeling a different film, I think with more of your entire body and, and kind of mind. Um, I, what's interesting about if you, if you work in these areas and you work in America, uh, in America, it's sort of interesting that uh, I did one of my plays in Japan called Sisters Matsumoto. It was translated into Japanese, it was presented in Japan, Tokyo, with a, you know, again, a whole Japanese American audience. They aren't Japanese American, they're Japanese. But nonetheless, it was interesting to sit in an audience watching this Japanese American story being told. And everyone in the audience leaned forward at the same time, leaned back, laughed, you know, albeit a little kind of softly all at the same time. And it, it made me realize that when you write things in America, people and they're, and they're specific to a culture, you know, then, then people are experiencing it on very different levels, you know? So if you were born and raised in Stockton in the 50s, uh, then <laughs> you're Japanese American, then this film will really, you know, get you in the hopefully the deepest kind of way. And otherwise, you're always seeing it on different levels. Uh, and it's sort of interesting that in America, that is how we view all these different works that, you know, we, we have different levels of experience of them. And you really have to work hard to make sure, I think, that you can dimensionalize your own being so that you can you know, enter into other people's stories in this country because it's, uh, it's a really interesting thing. Yeah, you know, uh, last month we had Stephen Okazaki um, mm -hmm. as our guest, and he was talking about the, um, the Hiroshima documentaries that he made mm -hmm. and that um, you know, someone, someone who's not Japanese, not Japanese-American, um, uh, commented on... Um, something about how uh, 
uh, I don't want to use the word fixated, but just how, uh, what a close relationship the survivors seem to have with death. And Stephen wanted to say, no, Japanese have a close relationship to death. You know, it's a cult, it's cultural. Mm-hmm. So um, anyone watching these films wouldn't think that it was odd, you know, to, to communicate with the dead constantly, mm-hmm. you know, or to keep the altars in the house or, you know, but that that's just a part of the culture. And so um, that, that reminded me um, what you just said of what Stephen was talking about. So, and in this film, the Japanese American relationship to death, does feel different, you know, for um, what really moved me was the scene where he's washing Nobu's body. Um, that mm-hmm. felt very Japanese to me. Did you, did you get that from, I mean, have you, a, a couple of questions in chat is, did you actually witness this sort of, um, you know, the process towards death, that personally? Uh, no. Not at, the, not at the time I made the film. And I, and I have to sort of trans, full transparency. Uh, and this gets back to the whole program. I'm also, you know, I've always watched Japanese films my entire life. And so some of the imagery and some of the feeling, yes, is drawn from that kind of background. Thus, you know, the characters do things sometimes that aren't quite Japanese American. I, I you know, but I'd like to think it still works in this particular world, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, yes, it's true. You know, some of the stuff is very kind of Japanese. Uh, and so Nova McCarthy's Japanese, but Saab Shimoto's from Sacramento. So it's sort of like the actors themselves <laughs> come from two different, the two different worlds. So mm-hmm. but yes, it is true. You know, another thing I loved is um, uh, the use of humor throughout this film. Mm-hmm. I think humor seems to be an important element for you. Like, do you always, do you like to balance a serious subject like death or the acceptance of death with mm. these little, these really little moments that are just really funny? Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that just is who I am. So everything I do always has small little elements of humor in it. Because uh, uh, I think it's just who I am and I allow it to be. And, uh, Mm. Um, let me let me read some of the comments from um, from the, our audience so that you can get a sense. Um, everybody just really loved watching this film. I'm glad that it worked out. Um, mm-hmm. I was nervous about you know doing the share screen, but I think it worked out. So um, let's see, uh, a poignant film, a beautiful acceptance of death and dying. Um, Someone wrote, at this stage in life, death is on my mind. This gave me a glimpse. Um, sorry, let me pull up some more. Um, what a beautiful, touching film. This was my first time seeing this. Um, uh, from Pam, I first saw this when it came out and I was at Nata. It was so good to see this again years later. It has much more meaning now, thank you. Um, as a Japanese American film, I love the mix of Japanese and American objects in the home and feelings too. Um, what do you think Khan had to learn? Um, I guess by moving out. Well, for me, you know, again, the idea was he was trying to figure out his own death. What is death? And that, you know, his attempt in being drawn as he says, he doesn't even know why he moved out or why he's there. I think on some level, he, he knows he's dying and that the woman is dying and that somehow by being near her, near her I, will, I will understand something about my own impending death. That was the idea that I had, you know, and they had that conversation about uh, it's kind of a human perfume. Death is kind of a human perfume. And that he leans in and then he inhales her in, in his attempt to kind of inhale the perfume, human perfume of, of death. I realized too, I added small little elements, which I, I'm happy I, I included them where 
there's a moment where, it's a small moment where they're eating together and she reaches out, Nobu reaches out and takes, tries to take Saab's hand. Yeah. And he pulls it away. And I mm -hmm. thought that was a really important moment in the storytelling. Uh, it allows it to be a little bit more complicated, not such an easy kind of love story, which it's, it is, but it isn't, you know? And so then pulling that hand away to me kind of, it makes it work and it have much more of a kind of a, a dignity to everybody's kind of characters, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. you're right. That was a good moment because um, also Saab's character, Khan, um, is not, he doesn't talk, right? Like Mary keeps asking him questions and he won't respond. Mm -hmm. So the only way you can sort of get at what he's feeling are these little moments, right? The, the mm -hmm. small gestures, because he just can't, he just won't express himself. Mm -hmm. um, so, which seems like a very Nisei, Sansei thing to do. <laughs> um, I do want to say that, you know, one of the things I've noticed in your films um, and in this one is that uh, you do a really great job of showing um, women characters. You seem to have a real sensitivity, a real feel for mm -hmm. women characters. Um, did you grow up with a lot of women in your life? No. <laughs> oh. But, you know, I, I grew up in a, like, there are three sons. I'm one of the three sons. <clears throat> but I do find that I'm drawn to female characters. And many of my plays feature female characters in the lead. <clears throat> Uh, Sisters Matsumoto, Ballad of Yachio, even in, you know, The Wash, there, the protagonist is a, a female, and uh, I feel most comfortable, again, I write, I just do things that my body gives me, and so I, I always have been drawn to uh, female characters, uh, and I can't explain it, well, I can't explain why, necessarily. I didn't wow. go around a lot of females, so... You do a great job. <laughs> um, I, there are some comments here about the match burning. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Ellen says, I thought that this was a symbol of watching life snuffing out. Um, the, Tracy says, the match helped him remember flames of the campfire with his son. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um, John says, uh, let it burn to the end, waste nothing. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. Um, Ellen, Eileen has a question. What is the hard part of making films? When it is done, it seems so logical and perfect. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hate to sound so technical, but it's just, it's like organizing a huge army and that you have to plan this huge sort of like siege and so you have to map everything out. <clears throat> in addition to also trying to do the story and the art of it, there's all this like going on behind the scenes of how you set it up. Um, so I would say, you know, the, the, what goes into making a film uh, is what is so hard to make the film. If it were just kind of writing the story and, and just sort of like, shooting it, if that were sort of just it, it would be, uh, it would be a, a form that I would have pursued and continue doing. But it did prove, because of the way I did them as sort of like self-produced, so I could do it exactly the way I wanted to with my friends. You know, it, it got to be a little exhausting, raising money, forming corporations, getting lawyers, uh, all of that. Uh, so it, kind of diminishes the whole art of everything. Um, and so I just kind of, that was, that was enough for me. So I would say, uh, and I went, I turned back to the theater because theater is actually, you know, you just write it and you give it to somebody. And that seemed like such a, a kind of easy, easier thing to do uh, for better or worse. But don't you work on producing plays? Uh, no, not, I don't. No. Okay. I have, but, you know, by and large, I've worked with theaters that they have everything, the mechanism in, in order, and uh, 
So. Um, I do have another question about film production, which is, do you have the vision of the final film as you're filming, or are you surprised yourself by the final product? I, I have a pretty clear idea as to how the film is going to look and turn out and be told, you know. My, mm -hmm. it, it, and it pretty much came out exactly the way I, I kind of envisioned it. Uh, we did cut some things out, which I'm really sorry we did. But there's a sequence in which Saab carries uh, Nova McCarthy up the stairs, and it took so much work for Saab to carry Nobu. <laughs> but it was a beautiful scene, but it just, we just couldn't put it in. It wasn't quite right, but boy, Saab carried up Nobu up the stairs. They're both kind of giggling the whole time. And, uh, but, uh, but, but they do turn out pretty close to the way I see them in my head, which sometimes can be a downside to filmmaking. I think it doesn't, you know, sometimes my ideas don't breathe a lot where you kind of work it out as you go along. I'm very much, everything's planned out. We have to shoot it the way I saw it. And we don't have money to go back and reshoot things. So uh, it's just the nature of it. Mm -hmm. um, did, the, did this film do well where it, where it showed? Mm -hmm. You know, all of these films, like the, my first film, you know, first it went to Sundance and then it went around the world in these small, they had these short film festivals. Um, like in the Berlin International Film Festival, this one I did called The Kiss. It uh -huh. traveled around the world. And, uh, and this one, uh, Drinking Tea, also was uh, officially became a selection for Sundance. And it, you know, it played um, in film festivals around the world. It also played on KQED, public television. It, the reason why I made it like 28 minutes or 26 minutes something is so it's exactly the format for KQED to show. And so I did all the public television things. And uh, so that one did well too. And then that allowed me to do my, my feature film that each of them did well. So I was able to kind of use that as kind of the platform to raise money and to uh, encourage people to participate into doing my final film. Interesting. There's, there's just a, I'm getting a torrent of comments here, so I'm trying to keep up. But um, before we shift over, because I do want to ask about some of your Japanese film influences. Mm -hmm. um, we, we talked about that just briefly. Um, someone says, uh, my son asks, this is from Lisa, my son asks, as a JA consuming Japanese art slash media, do you feel like you have privileged insight or understanding? Or do you feel like an outsider or somewhere in between? Um kind of existing in both worlds. Uh, and I think it's because I was raised in a Japanese American community. And then at one point, like at a very critical point in my life, like at 13 years old, we moved to an all white neighborhood. And I had to, and the, you know, there are differences. There are big differences in terms of how you negotiate the world, you know, how you speak up, don't speak up, you know, how you're viewed in terms of being good looking or not good looking, short or tall, you know, all of these things have cha changed for me. And I was able to struggle to sort of realize that there are two different ways that you negotiate the outside world and that it afforded me, I think, especially as I grew up during the, the period of the emergence of the Asian American movement, where it gave me finally, and I think a lot of you understand it, it finally gave me a kind of way to understand the world and why I felt the way I did about it and why it treated me the way it treated, treated me. And so I think that allowed me to begin to write from the inside out and to really trust that and say, what I feel is my story, it's my community story and it belongs. And so I don't have to justify, I don't have to even explain it. I can just write about it. At the same time, you know, you also live in a real world and by and large, it had been sort of very white. Uh, so you also realize too, as you create your art, you're also negotiating this other world that may look at your work, judge it uh, in terms of its value uh, from another lens and, and to always be aware of that. So, you know, I consider myself a Japanese American artist and it's, I have no problems with that. I've never seen it as a limitation. But I'd also 
they have always said that it's a live beast. You know, who I am as a Japanese American is not static, it's alive. And so as a consequence, as I talked about how, you know, I've been always interested in intersectionality, in particular African Americans and Japanese Americans, uh, and more recently Middle Eastern Americans, all those issues. But it's all part of, again, how being Japanese American for me is alive, and that it continues to like what it is and how it exists inside of my head my body is continually uh, moving forward, I'd like to think. You know? I try to make sure that I can crack myself open and continually grow and move forward. Never, again, never forgetting or never losing the fact that I grew up in this house, in this home, in this community that is very, is very distinct Japanese America. And that is, and I, I, I always accept that and know that that is kind of the roots of where my kind of uh, creation began and I always like to think it's a continuation of that so the idea again of is Japanese America going extinct you know I, I've always thought all I can do for me is that it it may not look sound or feel the same but I do know in terms of me what I create is a continuum of that and it may no longer look like it used to look or may not sound like it used to sound, or people may not even look at it the same way, but I know that, again, I have this continuum that I continue to sort of use and inform and grow. And that starts in Japanese America. You know, it very much does. And that's where I started in Stockton in the kind of agricultural area there. And I've always allowed that to be a part of uh, my expression. That's wonderful. I feel like I could talk to you for like another two hours, but um, we are, we are going to try to wrap it up a little bit. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but yeah. um, you know, uh, just speaking about the community, the Japanese American community, and maybe influences, and trying to um, touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, we lost someone recently, uh, Momoko Iko. Yeah. Um, did you know her? Oh. Yeah, my wife was good friends with her. They used to belong to, uh, you know, theater groups together or writers groups, women's writers groups in Los Angeles. Uh, mm -hmm. Wakaku Yamauchi, Momoko Iko, my wife mm -hmm. Diane Takei. Uh, so yes, we did know Momoko. And, you know, also knew, I knew her up here too, and she did plays up here. And uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was a big loss to lose Momoko. Yeah. Uh, did you know yeah. Momoko? Or? Me, I did not know, and I am another one of these plays that I'm trying to track down that I know was recorded was Gold Watch. Yeah. I think, yeah, right? I think PBS um, put it on TV at some point, so I that's think. another video that I'm trying to track down. You know, there's also one that, that Wakako Yamauchi did called And the Souls Shall Dance, which I think is one of the really solid, you know, if you want to get a Japanese-American story and play, it's a very solid one, and uh, not only as a play, but they made a, uh, I think, KCET or LA, which, whatever one in LA did a film version of it too. Oh, wow. And The Soul Shall Dance by Wakaku Yamauchi. Yamauchi. Thank you. Yeah, Yamauchi. I'll look, I'll look for it. I'm still looking. Hopefully we can get some of these archived um, and out to a, you know, a wider audience. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so this, this even, oh, go ahead. I wanted to tell you, because we originally, I think you folks talked about Japanese films. So I just yes. wanted to say, you know, in terms of one of my favorite films is, uh, my all time favorite film of all films is a film called Ikiru, uh, mm -hmm. To Live by uh, Kurosawa. And it's always been and remains for me the, the most moving and powerful film of the human experience. And, and if you know that film, then you can understand why I do the stories I do, because it's, you know, I very much am comfortable in that world. Also, I've always liked the filmmaker Ozu, uh, who does these very mon seemingly mundane stories that are very kind of simple about a father who's trying to get his daughter married off in a Tokyo story. But again, I do find, I find them uh, extremely, um, I can feel them very strongly. And so Ozu has also been someone who's influenced me. Mm -hmm. 
Well, how old were you when you saw these movies? First saw them? Oh, uh, I must have been like 13, 14, 15 when I started seeing them and uh, in Stockton. <laughs> wow. And you didn't think, um, you didn't find uh, the Ozu film slow? Uh, you know, I take it back. Ozu, I got to know later. I did. <laughs> it, it does require a little more of a kind of understanding or it would have been too slow. So Ozu, actually, I, it, I started discovering sort of in college. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and actually my appreciation grew for him as I, I grew older. So can I ask, where does Joe Ozu come from? Um, you know, I was writing a play, this was a long time ago, and a character appeared in my play named Joe Ozu. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know, like some of these actresses like, or actor, uh, I think it was at the time it was Stan Agee and uh, Tamlin Tamita. Mm -hmm. I think they might have played the roles it was, and uh, Joe Ozu was just this name that came up. But of course, if you say it together, it's Jozu. <laughs> so the idea is that, you know, Joe Ozu, it's, it's both the most common kind of name that is sort of almost fun and so common, Joe, and then Ozu, which is the filmmaker. And then if you say it together, it's Jozu. <laughs> So that's, that's what it is. And it's been something I've kind of held on to for a long time. Great. Do you hear that, everybody in the audience? We just heard a real inside baseball um, <laughs> uh, piece yeah, of that's information a there. Yeah, <laughs> um, And so you mentioned Ikiru, which uh, we have talked about um, yeah, as, yeah. Uh, in, our, in our group. Yeah. Um, are there other are there other directors or, or other movies that have influenced you? You know, they have. I don't. I haven't gone back to them that much. You know, and then I don't watch a lot of the current filmmakers. So I have to admit, there's there's one filmmaker who has done I think quite a few interesting films. He's the one that did. Um, he was the one that did that film called Is It Where the the Sun Goes Back. I'm sure you must have talked about it because he's. He's visited the Bay Area. I've met him several times at the, at the Japanese consulate. Uh, Do you mean Koreeda? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. You know. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's terrific. Yeah, very kind of unassuming, nice fellow, and uh, but yeah, his couple, especially his film about the one about the sun going back, and it's all pretty lonely, quiet. That one, I I, I appreciate. Though, mm -hmm. again, I, I'm much more of a fan of some of the earlier Japanese films. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, somebody in the chat mentioned that your film, Drinking Tea, reminded him of uh, another movie um, that came out in the past 10 years called Departures. That's, that's yeah, that's his film, I think, isn't it? Uh, I don't think he was the director for that. Who, but... who was the director of that, I think? Oh, I don't know. I can't Ar think of it. Arako Nagaishi is, is kind of, oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, but yes, Departures was a film that I, I thought was quite powerful, yes. Yeah, yeah. Somebody look it up and let me know. Um, but it, yeah, one for, it won for best foreign film. Um, yeah, oh. A while ago and it's really beautiful and it's again it's sort of this Japanese meditation on death yeah um, in a way that that I think all of us can really tap into um, oh you know another film I quite like was Woman in the Dunes and it's an old film but I saw it I tried to show it to my students one time because I thought I remembered it as being such a powerful film <laughs> I started showing it to my students and I realized it's so slow and it's all <laughs> shots of sand flowing, just sand flowing. It goes on for like hours. And I, re I realized, boy, this isn't the one to show to my students, young students, because it's That's, so yeah. slow. But Women in the Dunes by, I think, Tishigahara was a film I thought was quite, when I was younger, I thought was quite interesting. Well, that's a, yeah, that's a hard one, uh, <laughs> even for me. And I love Japanese films, but yeah. That uh, I think you like, um, but also, you know, you, your plays tend to go into the surreal also and kind of impressionistic and surreal, so. 
oh yeah, you know, there's uh, the filmmaker who made a film called Double Suicide, but he also yes. did a, another film that had featured, was it, doesn't, that featured like people with fish heads and, uh, but it was the same director who did Double Suicide and did a couple other films subsequent to that. Uh, oh, wow. I'm, I'm thinking Kobayashi, but I'm not no. totally sure. No? Uh, I can't think of his name. But I don't I'm, know the fish head one. Sorry. I tend to stay away from these surreal ones, uh, I have to say. I think that's the one, too, where he might have used this female onagata in his film, I think. Uh, it was a really well-known onagata, you know, female kabuki uh -huh. impersonator. Uh, but who's another filmmaker I met? I'm trying to think of his name. You know, a couple of the filmmakers I, I, I just had a chance to meet, spend some time with. And this one where I'm trying to think of, and I can't think of his name. But he, in the film with Tom Cruise about the Japanese, he plays like this Western samurai in a film. Oh, Tom Cruise. right. Yes. One of the generals in that is actually a Japanese filmmaker who, whom I had gotten to know briefly. Uh, and I was surprised to see him as an actor, but for what it's worth. Interesting. Okay, so here our crowd is, is helping us out. The director of Departures was Yojiro Takata. Okay. And the director of Double Suicide was um, Shinoda. Yes. Shinoda yes. Masahira. Yes, yes. Very good. Thank you, guys. You guys are the best. Um, <laughs> how's, your, how's your Nihongo? You know, it's so-so. It's I actually uh, did not speak it at home, though my parents spoke it, kind of a Nisei form. And, but I went to live in Japan, and uh, I went to live there where I hadn't spoken Japan, uh, Japanese before. I took a crash course and went there on an exchange program. And, I was, and then I left the program to study pottery. So actually, uh, I learned my Japanese sort of in the pottery village of Mashiko. Oh, wow. So got a bit of a, a bad kind of country <laughs> twist to it. And uh, it never got really good. But, you know, I was able to get by at some point where I could actually fake it. And you wouldn't know I wasn't Japanese because of the way I dressed and moved. But uh, I'm also, you know, a big, big uh, admirer of Japanese pottery. It's a whole other side to me that... Uh, uh, I don't talk about much, but I did spend time in Japan and subsequent to that, you know, and, and try, wow. to collect, try to collect some pots, but they're quite expensive. So, uh, but Japanese pottery is amazing because there are all these different schools of pottery all out throughout the, throughout the, uh, the nation. And uh, they're all kind of remarkable. Like, you know, people, Bizenyaki, which is very, it's mm -hmm. the one with the red kind of stripes kind of on it. And uh, mm -hmm. it's very, very popular. A couple of. Uh, do you still throw at all? No, and I was, you know, we we built our home in the Berkeley Hills, and one of the thing, early things I wanted to do was have a pottery studio. So initially, when we were building it, we had installed bigger gas lines, and uh, I even went around to all the neighbors and had them sign a waiver. <laughs> we weren't, we weren't going to do a wood burning kill, but we were going to use gas, and that still is a bit of a problem if you can imagine in Berkeley. Uh, yeah. But as we were building our house, we ran out of money. Go figure. <laughs> you know? So we finished the house, but we never finished the studio. And, and along the way, things kind of got a little lost along the way. But I did meet a gentleman named Ogawa who, was, who um, retired recently, but was using a wood firing kill, Japanese American fellow, in Oregon. And so I was able to spend some time up there kind of observing and watching him. And he used to do the wood farming kills, which you can't do anywhere, I think, except maybe in Oregon. But, you know, one is you have all this wood, but the kills are up a hill. They climb up a hill, nobody climbing kill, and you literally fire one, one chamber, get the heat up, and the heat from there goes up to the next one, and you fire the next chamber, and you literally fire it up the hill. And since you use a lot of wood, you know, it fall, the ash falls on the pots, and there's a lot of kind of drafts that aren't quite controlled and they cause pots to kind of warp. So they're rather imperfect, perfect. And uh, it's kind of a classic thing that uh, I really love the kind of perfect imperfection of a lot of Japanese pottery. So I like the other ones that are very you know, imari and you know, 
Kiyomizu that are really amazing, Kokitani, my heart is with the really rough-hewn ones. Yeah. Yeah, those are amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so, okay, I've kept you, I've kept yeah. you over. So let's just um, close out. I want to ask if you're working on um, what you're working on right now. And, you know, I've noticed that you like, um, I love the idea of sort of rebooting works or reworking things that you, you did from earlier, like yeah. the dream of Kitamura mm -hmm. um, ended up being reworked a few years ago and I saw it at Zellerbach. Oh, you um, did? I did. Oh my gosh. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Oh. Um, so, you know, are you, what are you working on now? And then are there works from your past that you would like to maybe revisit now? You know, there are a couple works that I would love to revisit. In particular, one called Fish Head Soup. Yep. It, it's one of my favorite plays, and it really is about this raw thing about internalized racism when you're Japanese American. And it, I put everything I had into that. And it's one that didn't have much life. It's one of my first plays that didn't go to New York after it was done on the West Coast. And, uh, you know, again, I, it has to do with some, you know, the times to the idea of having a kind of play about Asian Americans who are violent and, and are angry and uh, it wasn't quite the thing at the time. If any, if any piece, I would love for that one to have a new life. Well, I think I'm not quite sure it ever will given the politics of the time. And then I'm doing, uh, I really am interested in uh, you know, again, this idea, somebody mentioned about how as we age, you know, our interests, in particular for me, have to do with mortality. And so I'm, you know, my works now tend to, to tilt in that direction. Uh, and sometimes perhaps don't address issues that are more contemporary and timely right now, like a lot of the activism happening. It isn't that I'm not interested in them as much as what's on my, what's in, foregrounded for me now is personal mortality, is mortality, and then what that means in relationship to living day to day, with everything else that's going on. So uh, I'm working on a couple of pieces that try to contend with that. Wow, well, I would love to see um, Fish Head Soup brought back. Um, I do think it was a, ahead of its time a little bit, you know, like, it showed a dysfunctional family before. I think we called them dysfunctional families. Oh, yeah. So, where, did, where did you see that? Okay. I, you know, I have to admit, I, um, I read the play. Uh, I okay. haven't seen it performed. You know, it has a real interesting history in that I worked on that with a fellow named Oscar Eustace. And Oscar Eustace at the time was in the Bay Area, San Francisco, at a theater called Eureka. But Oscar eventually went on and now runs the public theater in New York that did Hamilton, that did a variety of things. And it's sort of interesting to think that he was, you know, we worked together on that particular play. And, uh, but he's, his trajectory has taken him way over there. So interesting wow. little note about that. Yes. And I'll add that um, I'm, we're getting comments here that Lisa loved fish head soup. Jill says, it was one of the it was one of the first plays I saw of Phillips, and it was an AATC production. Yeah, yes, yeah. I directed that. I think Wilbur might have worked on that one. I don't know. I think <laughs> oh. Wilbur, yeah. did you work on that one, Wilbur? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> well, sure. Let's bring it back. Of course. Okay. <laughs> All world. Um. Steve says, saw fr fish head soup in Seattle. Um, the mother was an amazing character. Oh, yeah, yeah. The mother really does a really interesting thing there, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, fish head soup. Mm. Well, great. Well, yeah. um, I, uh, would you like, I always give you the last word, so is there anything you'd like to close out with uh, that we didn't cover? Only again that, you know, uh, this is, this is my actual like wheelhouse <laughs> in terms of the people that I grew up with and the people that are sort of like family. So I appreciate having you all here. You know, whether we agree or don't agree, it's just, again, it's sort of very much the way I was raised. And uh, so thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, 
Hopefully we'll see each other soon.